Welcome to Discovering. Over the past several months, we've heard from a number of individuals and groups about the critical status of our deer herd, mainly in relation to habitat. This has brought up an overwhelming number of questions from sportsmen and women from across the Upper Peninsula. Questions about habitat and predators. What do we need to do to fix things? And most importantly, what can we do to help? Due to the overall importance and urgency of this matter, tonight's show is completely dedicated to answering those questions. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. We began talking about it on a show back in the end of December when I met with John Azoga. We've lost wintering range. We, we've, we've had a lot of areas that supported deer in the past that don't anymore. We got a bit of insight on how aspen plays into the overall picture back in January. This is high quality browse for moose and for deer. From there it was a visit with retired biologist Jim Hamill in February. We've got to reverse this if we want to have deer on our landscape. Most recently, we got a look at how the ongoing predator-prey study fits into the picture. Severe winter weather can reduce the condition of deer, which in turn can result in them having smaller fawns, which are more vulnerable to predation. All of this has, of course, brought up many questions. I've heard from many sportsmen and women who want to know how they can do their part to help, as well as from landowners wanting to know more about the impact they can have. I sat down with the UP Habitat Work Group to get their input on what we as sportsmen and women in the Upper Peninsula can do in this very crucial time. In June of 2014, Com uh, Commissioner Richardson reconstituted the Upper Peninsula uh, Habitat Work Group. And uh, as a result of that, uh, 13 uh, different people were uh, essentially invited to sit around the table and discuss and come to uh, some kind of agreements as to how we can move forward on improving deer winter range conditions. The people who were invited to sit around this table are those folks that were that are critically important to the various land ownership categories within Deer Winter Range. Of course, DNR is is very important, to owning about 20 percent of our Deer Winter Range. U.S. Forest Service is important with a couple million acres uh, in both the west and eastern Upper Peninsula. Uh, uh, commercial forest reserve landowners are critically important now that we have uh, about 2.3 million acres of CFR land in the Upper Peninsula and also private non-industrial uh, representation was critical to have on this group as well. I, I think the problem we're facing uh, with deer management in the Upper Peninsula right now is a lack of shelter in deer winter yarding complexes. Uh, that's the primary problem and the secondary problem is lack of food in those very same complexes. This issue has been festering and getting worse and worse over the decades primarily because there has never been a uh, consolidated and coordinated plan on how to manage habitat for wintering deer in these deer yarding complexes. Coordinating the uh, the management of that habitat in the yard is not an easy thing to do because every every landowner has different uh, goals for their property. So this is an effort to try to coordinate uh, some management within those deer yarding complexes. When, when we think that our entire deer resource in the UP, uh, essentially 100% of the deer live on 17% of the land surface during the winter period, it, it really points out the critical nature of managing those winter yards and yarding complexes properly. That's the challenge that faces us right now.
I always like to call it the perfect storm because you have the predators, you have the wolves, you have the coyotes, you have the bears, and they're doing the studies on how that affects it. You know, and those, you, you, can, you, know, you have some control over a lot of that, but one thing you can have a lot of control over is habitat. You know, and so the one thing we talked about is what can we do to have a more holistic approach towards why not A, where the deer yards are, B, who owns them, C, that we'd like people to look and make sure where we have the yards located, that the, those are yards. And if there's other places where the deer are yarding, we need to know that because we have to add those. And the interesting thing is only, I think it's 20% of the land area within these deer wintering complexes are state owned. And so there's a lot of other landowners involved, corporate landowners, small private landowners, federal forests and so forth that are all part of this picture. You know, we have an aging resource in a, in a lowland type. Spruce budworm is growing in the area. And so we really need to manage that timber resource to maintain healthy, all age classes, maintain that, that sustainable, resource, right? sustainable management, yes. And so if we don't accelerate our efforts in these lowland types, it will become a greater, greater problem for managing deer and, and the timber too. And to JR's point that we, we, we are gaining some knowledge uh, operationally of, of how to you know, accomplish what, some of these goals. So um, we're learning as we go. But each one of these times we meet and, and we try something new, it's just part of that learning process that we can pass that on to other corporate landowners or private landowners. I own 40 acres of land in Canton, Michigan. And I was going to write a management plan because I want to go into the Qualified Forest Act or the Commercial Forest Act. How much is that going to cost me extra if I manage it for habitat? And, you know, it'd always be nice to say, well, you know, if you do that, it's going to cost you an extra $1,700 because we don't want to cut those trees. So if you want to do this with that in mind, you know, here's what it's going to cost you, and you can make a decision based on that. And I think that would help people who are managing that land know what exactly what it was because sometimes people hear that and they're going like, well, I manage it because I want to, you know, I want to cut firewood on it. I want to, you know, I want to use it for revenue. And, yes, you can do that, but if you just do these small things within your management plan, it's going to really help the big picture, and I think if we can get that across to the landowner, you know, the smaller landowners, we, we're really doing the their favors. So. The success of the program is going to turn on the private non-industrial landowner, really. And uh, there are a number, uh, as JR just mentioned, there are a number of tax incentive programs out there right now that private non-industrial uh, landowners are, are aware of. and. And th but they all revolve around getting a management plan done for the property that you own. But let's make it clear, the places we're talking about that are lower in suitable shelter are within deer yards. There's plenty of conifer and it's being well managed in many, many places across the Upper Peninsula. But within those 57 deer wintering complexes, the one thing that we've seen that's common to all of them is a lack of shelter a lack of good conifer cover. And typically, when I say conifer cover, it doesn't matter if you're talking about white pine, hemlock, cedar, or a mixture of spruce and balsam. When we're talking about functional shelter for deer, we're talking about uh, trees that are at least 30 feet tall and those trees that provide about a 70% or greater canopy closure over your head. Those are the kind of trees that intercept snow and make it easier for deer to move around in the wintertime. They, they are accustomed to going to where their ancestors went and keeping those, you know, yeah. with the right habitat is key to this. That's the nature of this animal. Right. They, they can walk through the finest winter cover that you could even paint and walk uh, 10 or 20 miles further to go to a place that is historical for deer wintering and die there of malnutrition because there's not good enough quality habitat. And the interesting thing is in these deer wintering complexes, if you want to uh, healthier, healthy deer wintering areas, you need a combination of food and shelter. So you'll find in these deer wintering complexes that you know there's a combination of cover, which is uh, cedar and hemlock play a very huge role in that, but there's also other timber types that provide the food. And so when we look on the state land and as we're looking at a landscape approach, including other ownerships, we want to look at both the, the food and the cover aspect of that. And even on the state forest land, there is an opportunity to manage in these deer wintering complex to provide that food resource and make them a healthier spot, retaining that important winter cover, the functional cover, 
and, and managing the other timber types to provide a food resource. And so there is an opportunity for enhanced management in some of these areas also. We could easily run into a, a position where we have two or three mild winters back to back. And deer numbers would start this stair step upward again. And fawns would recruit and we'd have bigger age class of fawns. We'd get two or three good years and people might get in their mind, oh well. It's fixed. It's fixed, everything yeah. is fine. But it's not fixed because that's not, not sustainable. The next time you'd get a difficult winter, after taking two steps up, you'd fall off the staircase and go right down to the floor again right. because we don't have the winter habitat to sustain those animals. Hi, I'm Brian Whitens of 906 Outdoors. I'd like to invite you to join us at 906outdoors.com. You'll find UP weather, the DNR weekly fishing report, information about our TV shows, and a place to shop for quality UP products. Products built with UP integrity and made to last. We're adding new products all the time, so check back often. Visit us at 906outdoors.com. 906 Outdoors, it's where we live. Our main focus, of course, is the time of year. That's the bottleneck, and that's winter. But uh, if we can provide deer with good quality habitat on the summer range, the spring, summer, fall range, you can send the animals into winter in a little bit better shape and have them emerge onto habitat in the spring. That's, that can help them to recover from a bad winter. The average movement from deer, uh, of a deer from winter range to summer range in the Upper Peninsula is something like 10 to 10 to 12 miles. So deer that are currently where they are will be uh, three months from now should be on their summer range which is on an average 10 or 12 miles from where they spend the winter. So those people who own land that are not in deer winter range can also make big improvements on summer range which is I think the kind of thing that you're just alluding, alluding to. Because mm -hmm. when those deer leave winter range it isn't long before they're on their summer range. It might be a matter of a day or a couple days, three days, and they, they make that migrational uh, move and they're on summer range and yet they're still malnourished. They're still in very, diff very difficult straits physically, so they need as much uh, energy right then as possible and improving that summer range on those private, even private non-industrial lands is critical. Enhancing the birth and recruitment of fawns is where it's at. That's where we tip the, the scale back to an increasing deer population. Sure, you know, you can goof around with regulations for hunting bucks, how many bucks you can take, and we can really limit the amount of antlerless deer licenses, which we did, but it's creating that new cohort of fawns that entering the population and growing to adulthood which is what can cause us to, to get a growing deer population again. It's so important. It would be remiss for anyone to say that predation doesn't have a significant impact on deer numbers in the Upper Peninsula right now. Uh, it's, more, it's three times more likely for a deer to die of predation than it is at the hands of man right now in the Upper Peninsula. Deer yeah, up in the UP are faced with the, the largest suite of predators that they've ever encountered for over a hundred years. So this is a whole new ball game for white-tailed deer. There's no question that predators have impact an impact on this deer herd. However, habitat management can mitigate the impacts of predation on deer. Well, how does it do that? Well, it's all about the, the physical condition of these animals. When, they, when they're in yards, and they, when they come out of the yards, especially in the springtime, the better a condition that you can keep white-tailed deer, the more uh, resilient to predation that that animal is. And the quality of that deer's condition is wholly dependent upon the quality of habitat that it's depending on from the period of leaf off until green up in the springtime. So habitat plays a critical role in predation. The higher quality habitat you have, the less impact predation is gonna have. 
We have never been successful at controlling coyotes anywhere in this country, except on very, very small sites, very small sites. Uh, the federal government has poured millions of dollars into, pre into coyote control in the western states. There's as many coyotes out there right now as there ever has been. So predator control is not the answer, not the complete answer. It's However, part of the puzzle. It, it, it's part of it. It's, it's not the complete answer. We, we are, well, sir, I'll speak for myself, certainly in favor of, of wolf control, certainly in favor of harvesting coyotes uh, as a result of seasons that are available, certainly in favor of a controlled and, and sustainable harvest of black bears and bobcats and, and those other species that have an impact on deer. But the critical thing is habitat. 1995 and 1996, in those two winters, 94, 95, 95, 96, in the Upper Peninsula we lost a quarter of a million deer, 250,000 deer. They didn't die of predation, they died of malnutrition because the habitat was not sustain, uh, could not sustain that number of deer. Uh, I mean, that's a huge number of animals. That's more deer than predators will take, uh, will kill here in the next 50 years. So uh, if you, you got does coming out of deer yards in the springtime in poor physical condition, they're predisposed to predation. So it, it all, predation is directly related to habitat. And so we're dealing with the predation issue by dealing with the habitat issue. You know, we want to make money available to anyone from the person who owns 20 acres to the person who owns 10,000 acres. And part of the, another thing that we're going to work on is, you know, anywhere from the deer range improvement programs. And so you can sit down by yourself in your kitchen, fill out a form, and your application is going to be something that's going to be readable, acceptable, and you'll probably get a grant. A lot of it goes down state because they have people that write grants for a living. So what we want to do is try to get more people in the Upper Peninsula in touch with people who know how to write grants, and then we can help fund this through that. So, a dollar fifty is earmarked every time a person person buys a deer license, and it goes into this drip account, deer range improvement program. Well, we reallocate out fifty thousand dollars into this grant program, and it's been run for the last seven years by Bill Scullin out of our Norway office, and it's been very popular. Um, the deadline just occurred February twenty eighth. Bill said there were 12 applicants. Um, typically, uh, some of the conservation organizations or sportsmen's clubs are getting together applying for these things. And he says there's a request for way more than 50,000. So there's big interest. And it's for things like planting trees. It might be conifers, it might be oak, it might be crab apple, uh, might be seeding uh, openings, herbaceous openings. Um, all good things to get people involved in this conservation movement. And then the other thing we should mention is the Wildlife Habitat Grant, and that one's much bigger. There probably will be about a million dollars plus available again this year. That comes from the uh, recently passed license, license package, and uh, that's available in a little bigger installments. I think the minimum amount is 15000 that you apply for. And, uh, and like JR mentioned, it's, a lot of it's been going downstate just because we haven't really been successful in, in applying as organizations up here. And we're going to really work with with the clubs and interested individuals to see if we can try to get you know, a bigger, bigger slice of that pie coming back to the Upper Peninsula. That's for game species management and it would be great to use in the private land portions of these deer wintering complexes. If you come and ask, what can I do to make it work? We can answer that question. It's not a sort of thing, it's a science based, here's what you can do with what you have. And you know, so part of the things that people can do is reach out professional managers and say, hey, I want to do this because I care about, you know, I care about the deer population, I care about the habitat. It, it points out the need for, a, like, the development of a true conservation community in the Upper Peninsula. Dennis, you mentioned that the state only owns about 20, 23 percent of the deer wintering complex acreage. Right. We can do all kinds of things on that, but it's, it's not going to affect the broader complex as a whole if we don't have a lot of ownership in it. Um, you might mention that we've been meeting with Jeff and other managers of commercial forest land uh, regularly now to talk about what we can do on the 17% of deer wintering complexes that are owned by large corporate forest owners. We're, we're very pleased at 
the amount of interest and cooperation by commercial forests. As Craig said, we do have this cooperative effort in place right now in two of the higher ranking deer wintering complexes, one Mangy Creek and the other one is the Huron Mountains. And uh, we've been working on that probably five years now, I guess, and harvesting in those areas to a standard that uh, should maintain the cover that we're looking for there. Logging technology has changed a lot in the last decade and, and has allowed us to do enhanced management in some of our lowland areas. So, you know, it really can be a win-win situation. It's just not preservation. It's pr appropriate management on a sustainable basis. And so many of our lowland areas, you know, we are looking at managing them the right way to retain the value for deer, but also to, you know, re regenerate tree species and provide forest products for the um, state economy and do that in a sustainable way. And, you know, the commercial forest uh, industry is so important to the welfare of the Upper Peninsula. I mean, you, you can't, that, that's just the true statement. It's, in, it's critical to our economic welfare up here. And anything that we do within Deer Winter Range, we want it to be compatible with the commercial forest industry. And I think it's very possible to do, to, to do that. And it may even be possible to enhance conditions for putting timber, you know, as uh, commercial products at, at mill sites based on what we do uh, in planning these uh, deer winter range programs. And if we don't do something habitat wise, I feel that we have a chance to lose uh, enough deer in the Upper Peninsula so that the culture of deer hunting and the culture of the Upper Peninsula that surrounds deer, deer viewing and deer hunting is going to be in serious jeopardy. We feel like this is the unique opportunity we've been waiting for. The time is right, the stakeholders are right. We've come a long ways in a short amount of time. We, you know, we've got the stakeholders involved, we have the landowners involved. And what we, you know, it's not about us, it's not about tomorrow, it's about the future of our habitat. It's what our kids and our grandchildren are gonna get to see. And if we don't grab this opportunity, shame on us. And it's our time, it's our opportunity. And we're looking forward to doing this and making, you know, like Jim and I have said, Failure is not an option on this. We're gonna make this work and we need your help to do it. We appreciate it very much. For information about who to contact regarding habitat improvement on your land, please visit 906outdoors.com, click on Discovering, and then UP Deer Habitat. If you'd like to join a discussion about the status of our deer herd here in the UP, click on UP Deer Forum in that same location. Well, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.